Well, speaking of stomping grounds, it's the top of the hour. So let's begin. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. This is a wonderful meeting today. We have a lot to cover. We are with today's event. We're starting a new series within the Future Trends Forum. We're going to be exploring Web3 and what that idea might mean for academia. What is Web3? I mean, we can think of it as the intersection of virtual reality on the one hand, virtual worlds, and the blockchain along with Bitcoin and NFTs on the other. Perhaps there's more to it. Perhaps there are architectural foundations of decentralization. Perhaps there are issues here with corporate centralization of power. Perhaps this may take over the world. Perhaps it may fizzle or be somewhere in between. Our goal here at the forum is to collaboratively explore this question, and we're going to be doing it over a series of sessions. Now today, to kick us off, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome two great thinkers and practitioners in the subject, Vridi Saraf and Scott Meyer. Uh, each of these has been doing interesting projects in higher education as well as K through 12 and Web3. They've co-authored a wonderful paper, which you can take a look at called Web3, From Web3 to Ed3, which dives into what education might be in a Web3 environment. Uh, so I'm gonna bring them up one after the other, and then we'll start talking. So to begin with, let me introduce Vridi Saraf. Hello, Vridi. Hi there. Good to see you. How are you doing today? I'm great. It's great to see you guys and some familiar faces in the audience. Oh, good. Well, it's great to see you as well. And there's a really nice wash of natural light beaming on you right now, which is yeah. very, very appropriate. <laughs> Vridi, our, our custom on the forum, when we ask people to introduce themselves, is to ask them not about their past, but about their future. What are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the big projects and the big ideas that are going to be top of mind for Vridi? Yeah, that's a brilliant way to, to do introductions. Um, I, uh, I'll I'll talk about um, not just the next year, but maybe the next five to 10 years, um, just because okay. I think Web3 is a very long-term um, sort of uh, prospect here. Um, we're working on creating a space for educators where uh, access and uh, distance are, are not problems. Um, we're, we're trying to create a space where educators can come together, connect with each other, um, learn from each other, access all the resources that they need in order to create really incredible experiences for students. Um, mm -hmm. So, and that's, you know, in the metaverse and in those sort of web three worlds. So that's one thing that we're working on um, and we will be working on for the next, you know, five years. And then the other thing is um, creating a space for educators to come together um, as a community and benefit from all the things that they're doing in their yeah. communities. So it's yeah. not just that they're sort of like contributing to a platform or content or a Twitter or whatever, but they're actually yeah. gaining value from what they're doing. So the idea of decentralized IP ownership and the idea of like connectivity across borders. Uh, I have to ask, when you say we, who is we? Um, I'll answer that in two ways. One is uh, my team at K20 Educators, um, but then the other is everybody that you know wants to be involved in our DAO, which is basically any educator on the planet. Um, I really do think the ethos of Web3 is collaboration and, uh, and doing things collectively. And so the, the more people that want to be a part of this and want to change the way that education operates and benefit from it, both, you know, from a intellectual level and a sort of uh, fiscal level um, mm. can be. And so I think that's the magic of Web3 that anybody that wants to like be a part of it can. Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very bold vision, a very clear vision. Uh, and it's one that tells us a great deal. Well, let me bring up your partner in crime. Let me bring up Scott Meyer, who is coming to us from the frozen north. Um, <laughs> hello, Scott, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Hello, everybody. Good to see you. Well, well, you know, why don't you follow Viti here? What are you going to be doing for the next year in order to explain yourself to our people here? What are yeah, you going to be working yeah. on? What are the big topics and the big ideas? I think high level, I'm interested in scaling education. Like, how do we get more people educated? How do we get more than, you know, a, over a majority of Americans to have a higher education degree or something equivalent? And how do we get more than 7% of the world to have that? Uh, I'm really passionate that education is key to human flourishing, that people can pursue, you know, their talents. 
Um, and the more op uh, options we can give, I think the more that people will have a chance to do that. So I'm going to try to work on that and uh, learn from everyone here as well. So really excited for the discussion. Now, when you say you're going to work on this, what, what are you going to be doing? Are you going to be building software, social networking, holding events, writing books, starting a cult? What are you going to be doing? Yeah, no, I think uh, right now where my talents and interests lie is translating uh, this kind of technological world that I see into the educational space. So I'm doing a lot of writing uh, at ed3.gg, like good game, because I do think education is uh, becoming a game and um, trying to explain and explore what's possible. <clears throat> Um, really spark ideas that then could be used by all the amazing practitioners we have in the room here today. Fascinating. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we have a, a translator and a builder, uh, two experts and two visionaries. Uh, friends, I'm going to ask the, our guests a couple of quick questions to get things rolling. But the forum is here for you. It's for your questions and your comments. So remember the chat box. Remember the Q&A box. Remember to click your, you know, the raise hand button if you want to join us on stage, especially if you want to make people feel warmer because Vridi's in New York, um, Scott's in North Dakota, and they're probably very, very chilly. I I'm in Virginia, but, you know, we might need some more warmth here. Um, one question to ask is, uh, when people talk about the Web3 idea, they, they either tend to speak about it in terms of virtual reality and virtual worlds, the, uh, the metaverse idea, or they tend to speak about it in terms of the blockchain, uh, either having some form of credentials or content that's identified via shared blockchain, or by using, uh, as you said, Freedy, uh, some kind of physical work uh, through, uh, say, through Bitcoin, or through using NFTs uh, as a way of either signifying work or being creative. Now, I'm just curious, given those, those two big domains, um, how do you define Web3? So the, the main uh, crux of Web3 is that it's decentralized um, and the technology that is used to attain that vision can be varied. So Web3 is actually an ecosystem or the way that we define it is an ecosystem, a decentralized ecosystem of technology that supports virtual engagement and that supports the activities of things like the, the metaverse, things like um, uh, any type of engagement online. And so um, if you're thinking about it as an ecosystem of tools, then you can include the AR VR stuff in there. You can include blockchain in there. You can include, you know, social contracts, anything that you want into that. Um, but decentralization right now has been equated with blockchain because blockchain is the only technology or the latest technology that allows you to do that. Um, I personally don't think that it's going to be the last piece of technology that allows decentralization. I think that we are going to continue evolving and create more technology that even supersedes blockchain. And Web3 is just sort of like the onset of that era. So well, that's brilliant. That's a decentralized ecosystem with certain tools. And uh, we shouldn't expect these tools to be over with. We should expect more decentralizing tech to appear. Uh, that's a really, really great starting point. Thank you. Thank you. Scott, do you want to add more to that or is that good? Uh, I would just add, I think the concept of ownership is really important here where uh, you have a little bit more control over your own information, your own you know, finances, if you're talking about Bitcoin, whatever it might be. I think in education, the idea of like a self-sovereign uh, educator or learner is really interesting. And so it's going to be a spectrum, right? There's no like, this is no longer Web 2, this is now Web 3. It's really a spectrum, but we're really talking about the protocols that enable these things. And then I think educators and schools will have to figure out what combination of, uh, you know, decentralization versus centralization do they want? What what kind of uh, spectrum, where in the spectrum do they fall? So, um, yeah. yeah. I'm really glad you said that, Scott, because um, one of the things that I think is a little bit of a problematic uh, topic right now is that, you know, the folks that are really Web3 gung-ho are like, everything needs to be decentralized and, and Web2 is awful. And the truth is everything that we're doing right now is on Web2, right? So Web2 is not going to go away anytime soon. And it t it's going to take a lot of time for people to get onboarded um, to decentralized ecosystems or, or platforms or things that make those things accessible. But there's always going to be this, um, you know, foundational like uh, um, reliance on Web2 technology. And that is okay, right? Web2 is not like, it is a great, you know, infrastructure that has been set up that allows us to do literally everything that we've been doing. 
And so comparing Web 2 to Web 3 and saying Web 2 is like not great, but Web 3 is great, I think is actually quite problematic. Web 3 is just the evolution of Web 2, and that's okay. And then mm -hmm. the other thing about decentralization is that not everything needs to be de decentralized. Not everything has, you know, a, a great use case for decentralization. And so we really have to understand, like, what utility does decentralization have and will it actually achieve the, the goals that we want? And, you know, in some cases, maybe it's not a good idea to do it. Oh, this is fascinating. I mean, on the, on the one hand, you're talking about specific technologies. Uh, on the other hand, we're talking about architectural principles that range on ontology and philosophy. Um, friends, I have one more question I want to put to our guests, but, but please feel free with your questions. And also, above all, I forbid anybody in this conversation from being embarrassed. Uh, if you have any questions at all, this is a great place to ask them. Uh, do not at all think you can ask something that will make you seem dumb or ignorant. Um, this is a brand new way of approaching digital technology. It's happening really quickly. Uh, there's a lot moving on, a lot of acronyms, a lot of cute names. Um, and please, I want to make sure that you're all comfortable asking questions. Um, the second question I wanted to put to you both uh, sounds like it's coming from uh, ancient Chinese philosophy, but it's not. Uh, you referred to a Tao, um, and um, I was wondering if you could just quickly explain what a Tao is for everybody and what that might mean for education. Um, I'll take on the, the early definition, and then Scott, maybe you can go into it, and then I'll build on um, sure. what it means. So in its simplest form, a Tao is a community with a treasury. And uh, the purpose of the, tre the treasury is basically to uh, ensure that the activities of the community are being accomplished. And um, the, the beauty of a DAO is it's kind of like a co-op where, you know, everyone sort of like has a vote and is able to direct the uh, activities of the treasury. But the difference is that um, nothing can be done, no decisions can be made by any key players or any sort of like leaders or, you know, uh, founders of the, of the DAO, it's it's all based on community vote if the DAO is set up uh, right. There are a lot of different types of DAOs that exist, like it can be set up like a, a corporation, but um, if you set up a corporation like DAO, then no one's going to want to be a part of that. So a DAO is basically a community uh, with a treasury that lives on chain. And what does this mean for higher education? Yeah, this is powerful stuff. I mean, I think about, like Reedy said, I, I actually am in the co-op capital of the United States. So North Dakota has the most co-ops per uh, business in any uh, than any other state. And it's really a reinvention of that idea, right? Of how do we, uh, how do the employees own the business? Um, so what does that mean in education? What if the professors own the university, right? What if the students own the university? You can imagine where you don't need a central authority to uh, say that a certain degree is, you know, valid or you don't have to have a, all the other aspects the university might have, you might be able to flip the model where you get people coming together for short periods of time around a topic they're interested in. Um, they can validate their learning. Uh, so really what a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization means is just you can spin up institutions without all of the pieces for administration and maintenance. It's really, um, it's a co-op, right? So you can imagine co-op could be formed with different types of um, participants. Well, thank you, by the way, for uh, spelling it out. Um, uh, as an English professor in training, I always try to resist that myself, but, um, but I'm glad that you did that. <laughs> that helped that save us up. Uh, friends, I, I want to turn this over to you now. Um, uh, thinking about DAO, thinking about Ethereum, thinking about blockchain, what technical definitional questions do you have? Thinking about students, faculty, owning university, what questions do you have about how this applies to academia? Does this make sense or does this seem like a, something that's uh, not necessarily going to work or apply? Uh, and even before I can finish saying this, questions have come in. Uh, Rich Schultz from Golden uh, has a great question. Let me just put this up, a very specific one. We hear so much about NFTs. Many love the idea of evade money, but there is a considerable number that have concerns, especially related to climate change. Love to hear your thoughts. So I'm just reading this here, yeah. Um, so when we think about NFTs and, and climate change, what we're really talking about is the energy needed to to mine cryptocurrency, right? And um, the thing that makes cryptocurrency valuable is it takes a lot of computing power to mine one of these coins. And to get that computing power, you need energy, which is why there's actually a lot of crypto companies in North Dakota. Um, in the oil fields, they'll connect a pipe to the, uh, to the gas output, so the natural flare. Uh, they're now using that to power energy, which is really interesting. Um, but what you're going to start seeing is that there's alternative chains or what are called level twos. 
that don't require as much data going back and forth. So a blockchain, you can only send a little bit of information. So you have to send it often. Um, every time that's sent, it, the entire thing is resaved. So imagine just like sending a video file back and forth with your friends, like it gets slow. Um, but if you only send that file once a week and everything that's been added in that seven day period then gets uploaded, you know, it's a little bit easier. So uh, the climate change issue will get better. And the other thing that's I'm fascinated by is that um, the blockchain technology has actually forced a lot of innovation within renewables. Um, in my state of North Dakota, as an example, uh, trying to be carbon neutral by by 2030. And most of it is because of this new technology using gas flare for energy, which is really fascinating. So there's there could be positives there, but I think um, uh, we're gonna, gonna move away from the proof of work model, which takes a lot of energy. Yeah, and just to build on that, um, there was a question about uh, related to this, that uh, the energy that's consumed in blockchain is in computing hashes. And um, it's so to build on what Scott was saying, uh, the, the difference between proof of work and proof of stake is that uh, proof of stake actually gives uh, more ability for people that own more of the sort of percentage of the uh, the chain to be able to operate on it. And so it just minimizes like the uh, the energy it takes to actually verify a transaction. Um, in short, it's just, it's gonna be way more, uh, it's better for the environment and it's gonna take a lot less energy. Um, and, you know, there's a difference between like a, a, a second chain, um, uh, Scott, what did you say? I, I always like get this Which phrase. Level two? Or... Yeah, level two <laughs> second chain versus like the difference between a proof of work and proof of stake. So Ethereum right now is um, working to move towards proof of stake so that even Ethereum itself can be uh, better for the environment. So there's like this this uh, problem with, you know, this having a bad impact because of energy consumption on the environment is a very valid and concerning problem for everyone that works in blockchain and in crypto. So it's actually being actively um, uh, trying to be resolved. Um, and it, it's definitely on everyone's minds. Well, great question, Rich. And, and thank you both, uh, Vridi and Scott, for really solid answers. Uh, and by the way, just quickly, uh, Vridi, can you define Ethereum? Or Scott, since you use ETH more, would you like to define it? <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just a, it's like, um, you know, you, it's like blockchain. It's it's a different, different chain, essentially. So the Ethereum network or Ethereum chain is one. You would have things like Arbitrum. You'd have things like, um, so it, it's just a different kind of set of rails in a way. Um, so you kind of have to build on one. And that's, I think, the really interesting challenge is this multi-chain world. So right now, if I have money on Ethereum, I have to move it over um, you know, to Bitcoin or move it over into Solana or whatever it might be. In the future, it'll work better where we can use all of these things, right? So that we don't have to all use one and clog it up. So yeah, that's the, the quick yeah. high level answer. <laughs> and the interesting thing about blockchain is that there are some chains that have utility uh, for doing different things on them, like building you know, con contracts on them like NFTs or whatever. Mm -hmm. And there are some that don't. Like, for example, Bitcoin does not support any you know, utility-based um, activity on it. So you're not going to see an NFT on Bitcoin ever just because mm -hmm. you, you can't do it. But on Ethereum, the way that it was, it was built out, you can actually build social contracts on it. You can build you know, tokenization on it. You can build a lot of stuff on it, um, as well as Solana and any other new chains that are happening. But there are like several chains that are actually emerging as leaders just because they operate better and they're easy to build on versus other chains that are you know, not doing as well. But yeah, the utility is definitely determined by like how the chain is built. Uh, we had a quick question that came in the chat. So I'm just going to read this uh, from Re, a clarification. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm interpreting correctly, but NFT blockchain gives opportunity to own. Oops, sorry. Uh, sorry, the question just disappeared. I want to bring it right back. Um, Oh, I just lost this again. Uh, does NFT blockchain give opportunity to own part of a share of ownership, like buying stocks for a company? So uh, I'll just jump in there. NFTs are really just a file type. So NFTs um, are just like a .mov, .jpg, .gif, whatever it might be. Um, it has JSON code in it, so it can really be created to be a lot of things. But what makes it powerful is that you can put these into smart contracts. So if I have an NFT, 
I now get access to something. So an NFT could be a ticket. Uh, an NFT, for example, if uh, Invisible College is an online, uh, they're trying to be a college online. If yeah. you have their NFT, you get access to their lectures, right? Uh, an NFT can also be a piece of art, which is what a lot of people have seen. So it's a it's a digital piece of art. And what makes it interesting is that you can prove ownership. So of course I can right click and save it, but I can also take a picture in front of the Mona Lisa. That doesn't mean that it's mine. And what's interesting about um, NFTs is that the functionality. So you can see where now I go into a video game and I can decorate my virtual house with any of the art that I own. No one else could, could do that, right? Um, yeah, and there's a lot of other uses. So just think of NFT as a file type. Uh, there's a big explosion right now in music NFTs, which is fascinating, where all of the licensing information is wrapped in this file. So whenever you buy a song from me, 5% goes to Reedy because she did the drums, 10% goes to Brian because he did the lyrics, 50% goes to me because you know I, I sang it, whatever. So you can imagine where this gets rid of a lot of gatekeepers. And in the education world, what would it look like if somebody bought, instead of your textbook, they bought your NFT, which had all of the content in it, right? And now instead of the money going to HarperCollins or whoever, uh, you know, it's going to go 50% to Brian because he was the, the lead author, 40% to Reedy and 10% to me because I built the, the contract, right? So uh, it really gets rid of some of those middle people um, that might take right now a cruise value, right? And it goes more to the creators. So that's why I think NFTs are exciting is they're really flexible. Re, yeah. that was a really good question. Um, and just to build on that, um, the way that an NFT works is you can, it, it's, you know, it's it's kind of like a package that has what Scott was saying, which is like the file, but it also has a contract and it can also have anything else like unlockable content. So if yeah. I want to put stuff in this like NFT package, I can put a contract that says that anytime any this NFT gets passed from one owner to the next, they get to yes. own all the IP in this NFT that can be part of the contract. Or I can say that um, anytime this NFT gets passed on to somebody else, the royalties of the, like a percentage of the new sale goes back to the original owner. Or they can say that, um, you know, in, in a year, this NFT is, is actually going to, you know, dissolve and you're actually going to in, instead get a token that will give you access to a new community. So you can actually like, create like put sure. basically anything into this like package that's an nft that can um can uh manifest at any time of the ownership of the nft yeah so it's kind of like uh, getting software or a um, an application we, we have more questions coming in and by the way we have a whole bunch of text questions no one's virtually raising their hand but please feel free to, <laughs> uh, you can tell that Riti and scott are incredibly nice uh, and are uh, happy to answer your questions. Uh, we have another follow-up just specifically on NFTs uh, from uh, uh, Simone uh, Ravioli. What about NFT credentials? What they can what can they add to digital credentials, like open badges? Yeah, they can add a lot. Um, you know, I love Simone's work has been incredible around open badges and the ability for a bottoms-up approach to credentialing, which I think is really powerful. Uh, I think the most common sort of NFT you might hear about right now for giving um, a credential of sorts is called a POAP, a proof of attendance protocol, which is essentially an easy way to tell people like you you did something. Um, and so you could see where you get, you know, really micro credentials, even more micro than what universities call micro credentials, right, for doing a specific activity. Uh, I'm doing a project right now with the school in India with uh, fifth graders, and essentially they're getting these POAPs, these NFTs for for learning specific things. So as they complete the assignment, they get a POAP. And then what makes that unique is that can travel with them. So I don't have to spend the $5 and call my alma mater to get my transcript, right? It goes with me. Uh, and so that's kind of where uh, we see a lot of action in the credential space. Um, I just put a, a long post up about kind of digital credentials, which I think is a good read, but kind of the three core pieces you can think about that are part of this is the decentralized identity. So that could be a person. It could also be a computer, but it's like, we know that this information is tied to Scott Meyer. And then we have the actual verifiable credential. So we know that Scott Meyer did or learned this thing. We don't need, uh, you know, the uh, accreditation body coming to, to prove that, or we don't need a, a grader, like it's been verified. And then we have the wallet, which is how I show it off and keep it, right? And I think what'll be interesting is that we probably will have different types of wallets. Um, you know, you think about when I send a resume in to a job, that'll look different than my resume that I maybe send into grad school. And so if you own your credentials, you own these different NFTs that represent your learning journey, you can decide which ones to showcase, which ones to show the professors um, and, and kind of be self-sovereign, right? So I think 
there's a, a big change. Yeah. And I know that someone mentioned ASU in there. I know they've done a little bit of work there. Um, mm -hmm. I think what's exciting is the potential of grassroots accreditation potentially. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, I think there's a, the, a fourth category here, is which is what does your credential or your badge give you access to? Yeah. Um, and so it, it's possible for, you know, maybe in the education of the future, there aren't these like universities that are very, um, you know, inaccessible to people all around the world because of location or, or, or uh, affordability or whatever, but Instead, um, a credential actually gives you access to this, like, you know, university club uh, that you can gain network from, you can gain value, content, resources, things like that from because you own that credential, but not because you, like, went to that school. So the, the credentials actually can be, like, a gateway to community, it can be a gateway to resources, things like that. And then um, just to sort of put what idea what what Scott said into like a capsule of an idea, the idea of um, owning your educational identity becomes a lifelong pursuit because of NFT micro credentials instead of something that just lives within an institution. So with the type of like portfolio that Scott is talking about, you can have a, an NFT micro credential in high school or several of them in, in college, in grad school, but also when you're 80, you are going to have those credentials with you and have this like lifetime worth of academic learning that you can access anytime and you never have to sort of like call somebody to like get your transcript or, or mesh all of them together. It, it sort of all lives within your possession in, in a continuous way. I have to ask the quick boneheaded question, which is what about all these horrible stories of people who lose their password to their Bitcoin and they therefore lose the money? Uh, is this something that every holder of a distributed uh, certification will have to worry about? Yes. Yeah, it's really it's really important to learn a little bit about wallet security, which is essentially you have a seed phrase, which is kind of a long string of words. And um, unfortunately, right now, the best way to keep that secure is to write it physically and put it in different places. Uh, and that's going to be interesting to see how that evolves. Um, you know, that's kind of the downside, right, of unbundling or decentralizing is you don't have someone to take care of those things and so it'll be fascinating because i don't know if the public wants total decentralization right and so that, like i said i think it'll fall somewhere in that spectrum where we're probably going to be okay with centralization and maybe people prefer the registrar or maybe they don't have access to it because i live you know in a rural community in a country that doesn't have good education system but if i can go online and prove that i'm just as good as the person who went to north dakota state in fargo and the employer says anyone with this NFT can apply for the job. Now all of a sudden I have access that I didn't have previously just because I didn't have, you know, a near geography or, or funds to pay for school. Uh, I'm, that's a great answer. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and Freddie, that, that reminds me of your earlier point about not everything being decentralized and having to negotiate and figure this out. So far, these have been terrific questions. And I want to add to them now by bringing up a video question. Uh, this is Jen Obando from Stevens Institute of Technology. And let me just bring her on stage. Hello, Jen. Good to see you. Hi. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Yeah. Great. So I think uh, my head is reeling. Um, I'm just starting to learn about NFTs and things like that. So this conversation has my head going in all sorts of directions regarding higher ed. And I've placed some of my thoughts in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing that I can think of, right, is, you know, how this could get really messy for higher education at the very beginning, right? If the whole idea is to decentralize, you know, where I think there still needs to be some sort of oversight to do this in an organized fashion before we get like another gold rush movement where they're going to be really great winners and a lot of losers in the game. Um, and the, you know, the other kind of the other part of the question, I'm sorry, I'm hearing an echo, mm -hmm. like throwing myself off. Um, oh, you're good. Thanks. You know, uh, I think, oh, geez, I forgot who mentioned it. Um, you know, the digital divide that we already see, right? I'm thinking, all right, great. So if the future, you know, is Web3 and NFT and blockchain, I'm going to be in a great position if I'm a creative and I can create things that I can then, you know, make a financial gain off of. But what if I don't consider myself a creative? Like, where do I fall now if the middlemen are being kind of left out of the conversation? 
And by the way, I'm going to make these little drawings into NFTs soon. It'll be up yeah, for soon. Watch out for it. <laughs> so that's my question. Thank you, Jen. Please go ahead, friends. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's a lot there. I think uh, on the kind of the latter point about being a creative and kind of who benefits, I think um, you can you don't have to be the creator to benefit, right? Like you can be an owner. Um, I think in the education, it's interesting to think if you are a teacher or instructor, there's a question about adjuncts. Um, you know, you could essentially get get paid based on the people coming to your class, right? So if you if people take your class, you actually own that NFT and anyone who owns that has a percentage of the proceeds coming in. Because again, all that could be created as a like a contract, a smart contract. So, so I could offer opportunities, but you could... Uh, you don't have to be making art. Uh, you could also be making knowledge, right? Or you could also be documenting experience. And so you can think about NFTs not just as proof of learning, but also just proof of life. And I know like um, the POAP organization, they just raised 10 million this week. And that was kind of their pitch is like, we're more about human flourishing, like gamifying life. Like we're going to get you to go on that run because you'll get a POAP just like you go on that run because you're iPhone says, you know, your iWatch says you're almost completed the circle, right? And you get the little badge, right? Um, and I think it will be messy, but I think what the the way that this will get filtered out is Breezy's point about what it leads to. So I don't imagine a central authority saying like, here's, you know, here's the uh, protocol or here's the thing that, that everyone's going to accept, but instead employers, uh, individuals who say, anyone who's done this, I'll accept, right? And you're already seeing that with Google saying, if you've taken our certificate, you know, we'll interview you. Um, and so I think it'll get messy, but what I think will happen is that fewer employers will outsource quality to higher ed and they'll kind of take it upon themselves more. Um, so I don't know, I'd be curious to your question too, Brady. I think that's a lot of people's fear is that decentralization will ultimately lead back to centralization, right? And maybe it's just that process of always bundling and unbundling. Um, but I do think like the ability in Web3 to take what exists fork it, which means like make a copy of it and then change it means that if somebody wants to offer an alternative, it's kind of like um, open source software. You can just take it and then build your own version. But the trick will be getting people to take your class, accept your class if they're an employer, right. you know, that kind of thing. Well, somebody in the chat made a, 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 a um, drew a similarity between uh, charter schools, right? Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. that we saw a big boom at one point and then there was a big, uh, a lot of enrollment in those in those schools, at least in New Jersey where I'm from, and then it kind of like tapered out. And you know, the hardcore believers are still in the charter schools, but mm -hmm. you know, public schools are still around. So, yeah. and we see here in uh, Virginia, we just installed a new governor who is uh, keen on charter schools. So we'll see. Um, that's something I'm watching for. Yeah, um, just to to add to that, uh, I think we we have to think about like what is the purpose of decentralization. And the purpose is to um, to ensure that people have ownership over their activities and their decisions and what they're a part of. And so um, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, with decentralization, there's no leadership or with decentralization, like everybody's sort of like running around with like their heads on fire. It just means that like anything that people are a part of, they can make a decision um, uh, for how they are engaging and how that their activity is being monetized. So for example, like on Twitter right now, when you put content into the Twitterverse, like it, it, you can't monetize off of that content unless you make it gated okay. and people can actually sort of like pay to see your content, right? With, um, with decentralization, ownership of, of IP, you, and anyone can use that content. With ownership of IP, you know, in the new sort of like Web3 world, you would be able to actually like own the IP that you're creating on Twitter or on a social media platform. And you could actually take that and, and reuse it somewhere else and monetize off of it. Um, but back to your sort of like, you know, running around sort of like, you know, in a decentralized world where there's no leadership. Like if you think about DAOs, for example, the decentralized autonom aut autonomous organizations that we talked about before, let's say there are 10,000 people part of a DAO. And the way that the DAO works is that everybody actually is like an equal owner in the DAO. That doesn't mean that every single person in the DAO is going to um, make a decision on um, how the treasury operates in the DAO. Um, and they're going to be competing decisions. It's going to, it kind of means that there's like, you know, owners of or leaders that are um, making proposals for different parts of how the DAO operates and everybody's voting on those proposals. So they get to actually 
decide whether something happens by you by democratic vote but it's not that like there's no leadership whatsoever and you know everyone's sort of like competing to figure out like what's happening in the dow so and then the other part of this is that it's it's what scott was saying you know in order to make decentralized platforms blockchain you know web3 technology accessible there are all of these like intermediate companies that are popping up that are creating platforms that allow you to actually access that technology. So if you think about like these NFT marketplaces like OpenSea, Rarible, Soul Market, whatever, even though they're using blockchain technology or you know NFTs to to help you trade NFTs or buy NFTs, their platform is centralized. Like OpenSea is a private C corp, right? It is not a, you know, socially owned uh, C-Corp. It is a private company that is allowing you to make transactions on blockchain. And so there's always going to be that intermediary that is going to help you figure out how to use something that's going to help you verify your credentials, that's going to help you recover your passwords or whatever it is. That's always going to exist. And without that, I'm not sure we could actually operate in any kind of web world. Um, but yeah, so... Yeah, I, I think that's about it. <laughs> that, that's beautifully said. It brings me back to the old peer-to-peer -peer days. Thank um, you. Jen, thank you so much for that. For the, and let me just make uh, two really quick uh, meta observations. First, uh, if you're just joining us uh, or you're just joining us for the past few minutes, welcome. We're having a very energetic exploration of Web3 for higher education. And uh, also, I just want to uh, give a shout out to Sarah San Gregorio, who had a wonderful moment just now. She said in the chat, it was great to hear Jen's voice. I think that's one of the real pleasures of this medium. It's great to reconnect. Um, we have all kinds of questions uh, coming in. Uh, so let me just ask all of you in the chat and those of you who have put up text questions, would you mind if I shared these as a blog post, anonymizing each person? So it would just be the question content and not by name. Please put your thoughts in the chat box if this is good or bad for you. Let me know. I'm completely ruled by your decision in this case. Uh, we had a question coming up uh, from uh, several questions coming up from our friend Jonathan Parts, and I want to bring John up here to give him a chance. Uh, let's see if we can beam him up from Colorado. Hello, Jonathan. Good to see you. Hi, Brian. Hi, hi Scott and Rudy. Nice hi, to meet you. Yeah. Um, so, I, can I ask the question I, I always ask in these kind I'm, I'm so I'm a, um, a part-time cryptographer crit and educator, and I. Um, part, uh, I've, I've worked as a I've, I've worked as a cryptographer in industry, and also I, I'm a computer scientist. Um, I don't. I, the whole discussion makes my head sort of explode. It seems to me that what we're experiencing is kind of um, regulatory capture by metaphor. I mean, there's this there are these great metaphors around blockchains and DAOs and things, and they they really are evocative metaphors of it. Decentralization is so wonderful. We we all have those images of Big Brother and how we want Big Brother out of our life. So decentralization is going to solve all our problems. And you know, trust the idea that there are these that, that the blockchain is some sort of regular you know sort of an institutionalized form of trust. And we 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 talk about them in this metaphorical way and. People make policy decisions as if those metaphors were reality, and they're just not. I mean, I mean, as someone who does the crypto, it's just not. And and so the question I always ask people is like, all this, just you know, let's talk. But just one little example of where the metaphor I think is just in, is just kind of insane. Let's talk about micro credentials. People are always talking, oh, hey, it's going to be so wonderful when students get to have complete control of their educational records. They'll have their credential, it will be on the blockchain, they can reveal it in some way, because the blockchain is public, so there's really not a lot of revealing going on, but they're never gonna have to pay those $5 or $10 to the registrar of that institution where they got that degree. Those records on the blockchain have been digitally signed by the issuing institution. Otherwise, any damn fool could just put some random thing on the blockchain and it would look like it was a valid credential. So presumably, there's a public key infrastructure behind the scenes that the institutions that issue credentials all have a key and they have signed your credential before it's on, before the micro-credential, before it goes onto the onto the chain. So why do we need a chain? Why don't we simply hand graduates of every if you want to do this for class by class, that POAP thing you were just saying a minute ago, Scott, you know, every class you attend, just get, you know, hand someone, email someone a little bit, um, piece of data which has a digital signature that your teacher saw you in class, or if you finish a degree, your institution, you know, you know, MIT gave you a degree in computer science. They MIT signs your diploma. Why don't we hand someone 
a file on a thumb drive or something and say, now you control this. When you don't, don't write back to the MIT registrar, just plug it into your computer and email that docu signed document to whoever you want to prove that you have that degree. So this whole idea of building these huge, so the whole idea of Web3 that we need this whole new infrastructure, we don't. We use something that was invented in the 1970s, public key signatures, and it all happens for free. So I, it seems like it's, Metaphors have just gone crazy, or, or am I wrong about about micro credentials? Maybe I'm completely misinterpreting micro credentials. But is that not a solution to the to the problem that micro credentials purport to solve? I think. Um, uh, oh, if I can jump in, I would just say like the exciting addition. So you're definitely talking about ownership, right? And like instead of a digital wallet, you have a physical wallet or a pocket or a USDB drive or whatever. But what you're able to do now is. I could actually go find everyone who did a certain event, whether I was in that event or not. And so instead of me calling the alumni office and saying, hey, what Harvard alumni can I go find in this town that I'm in? And now I can call them up and try to get a job. I could actually just go find who was at the entrepreneurship club meeting on Friday and and airdrop them a token or I could airdrop them an offer. I could give them a, so you can build networks off of those uh credentials even as small as like going to a pizza party um a lot of that's going to be junk right and so like we don't want to show that so i think that'll be interesting is like how will people filter their own display of their okay Scott, so you take a sideways step you like the use case of sort of decentralizing and giving learners control over their academic records you're saying okay that let's put that aside let's talk about some centralized thing where we can count how many people who got certain kinds of degrees by my by data mining on the, on the blockchain Okay, that's an interesting side use case, maybe, but okay. still, the, 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 the thing that a lot of people are saying about credentials on the chain, the chain is if there were a chain, like they were a cloud, but you know, the, the, it's, you still haven't answered my question of why don't we just hand them a digitally signed record, a data, data chunk? Isn't that the same thing? If you want learner control of their records, give them their records and sign them, because you're going to have to anyway on the blockchain. Well done. Yeah. Well, you can't, but what I'm saying is like, you could do that with the education, right? If they're, if you have a signed education experience, now I can find those people, connect with them, use that, use it a, like in a composable way. Right. Um, where if it was on a USB drive, not accessible by others, you kind of have that limitation. So I don't know if I'm, if I'm misunderstanding, but you know, yeah, I think I'll, a lot I'll of this is reinvention, that. you know, yeah, go ahead. Reed. Yeah. I, so, so to, um, the way to, the, to, to think about this is not necessarily like what is the technology, but it's more about what is the utility and why are we doing it? And so if you think about like, what is the purpose of something being decentralized? It's uh, the utility that Scott just named, which is like you can um, access it from many different points. It's interoperable between different institutions or organizations or, you know, entities. Um, it allows, you, you know, public a show of what's happening so you can actually like find community without having to like go deep into Google to, to find like kindred spirits. You can actually find them through these badges and credentials. And then the, the, the biggest thing here is that it is enabling a conversation about ownership of your edu educational identity and unbundling education, right? Forget the fact that like, you know, you can do things on blockchain, you can put things on blockchain, like the fact that we're actually talking about how to unbundle education, how to create these specific instances where you can learn what you want to learn when you want to learn it. That's the biggest, um, you know, value that we're going to get out of Web3, not necessarily like the technology itself, because like I said before, like blockchain is the first of the decentralized technology. There's going to be way more things that emerge in the future that's going to allow us to continue to enhance this. So if you want to sort of like shift your perspective into, you know, what is possible and what can I accomplish from this? Think about utility. Think about how it's actually changing the way that education can operate and then think about the technology. That's that's how I think about it anyway. Yeah, okay, that, that's, I, I'm happy to have those conversations. I think it's it's weird that those conversations, I mean, I, I'm in the state of Colorado and I've been in meetings at the Department of Education in Colorado where we have solution providers who are trying to sell their, you know, they have a lot of money, they have a lot of venture capital in these areas. And then we have, the, as you were mentioning, Vidi, there are these you know, intermediaries who have a platform on which we can do X, Y, or Z. And they want, they want the state to put a lot of money on their platform. And they, 
they're sort of thrashing around as if that we have a technology, we want, we want a problem that we can solve. And, you know, the one they, in the education context, they're always saying, well, we want learners to have control over their records. That's the thing I hear over and over and over again. And sure, hand them a thumb drive with a signed copy, you know, we could do it tomorrow. I, I was in a meeting once and I said to these VC funded people, let's do it tomorrow. Let's just take all of the high school diplomas of recognized high schools in, in Colorado. Let's scan them with a high resolution scanner and let's have, the, let's have the state department of education digitally sign those documents and give every high school graduate a copy of that file. And they will never again have to worry about waiting for their proof of having a high school diploma until they get the, the mails, blah, blah, blah. What if, just, what if you know, I lose my USB? <laughs> Like losing yeah, okay, the same thing Scott said before. Don't lose your don't lose your private key ever. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So let's centralize it. That's a good idea, really. Let's centralize everything. I mean, but then I, I have that, to call somebody else to, to get my my records, and then I can't build on them, right? So like, if there's one institution giving me my credentials, and if I go to a different institution, or if I decide to change something about the you know my location, you know my major, whatever it is. And I have to like figure out how they can actually connect with each other. And I probably have to pay somebody to do that instead of like them just continuing to live in my one portfolio. Like my identity is attached to my wallet. And so everything that happens with me can live there. And then it's not just about academics. So like, for example, if I'm applying to a job and I want the, the employer to know like all the cool things that I have learned and I have skills in academically and professionally, but I also want them to know that I'm really passionate about social impact. And I'm really passionate about plants. Um, I can actually have some of those credentials live in that same portfolio and people can get like a full perspective on who I am as a human. Okay, I, 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 I love everyone having control of their web identity. Sure, let's all own our websites and, and put whatever we want on them. Or maybe some third party can sell a service where they keep like micro, we'll call it Facebook or something, where you keep you know, some version of your public identity. Um, well, that sounds, I, uh, that, that I don't sounds, know. That sounds like Web 2.0 and Web 1.0 as well, like the Indie Web. Uh, John, yeah. John I, I, I've got a stack of folks who have other questions I got to bring up. I want to thank you. And after Great. our team on Twitter, I'm delighted that you're here. Thank you so much. Uh, friends, everybody else, that's another example of video question. So if you want to click the raised hand to join us on stage, you can do that. Um, and if, uh, again, we have a wide range of perspectives and we're tackling this from a whole bunch of angles. Uh, by the way, in the chat, people seem okay with me doing a blog post with the recording plus the text. Thank you all. I'm really glad to do that because we're, we've got a lot coming up. Um, we have a whole bunch of other questions, and I want to make sure that we can cover as many topics as possible. Uh, I mentioned the awesome Sarah San Gregorio, and she had a really interesting question. Again, this is a philosophical question. Perhaps, uh, Vridi, this might start with you. Uh, she asks, this seems to rub up against the increasing commodification of higher education. Have we started seeing institutions looking at implementing aspects of Web3 in their current ecosystems? I guess that's two different questions about the commodification and also are we seeing this in play? Yeah, that's actually a really good segue from uh, what, you know, John's uh, sort of basic ethos of like what can go wrong with Web3 and why do we even mm -hmm. need it? I think it's really important just to sort of recognize um, sort of his trail and train for a second is that if we don't ask the hard questions of why Web3 sh doesn't work or shouldn't work or, you know, why we can't do what we can do with Web2, then we're never going to progress. And so it's actually really important that we ask those tough questions. One of the, like, things that, like, hasn't been talked about as much as it should is um, are the, uh, the ethics of Web3 and how decentralization can actually, you know, both help with that and hurt that if you're anonymizing yourself in a metaverse world or in a virtual world like what can be the things that can go wrong there and so like all of these questions are really important to ask and and i just just sort of like get on the soapbox for a second like the more we ask these tough questions the better the technology and the experiences are going to get for everyone so like i, I really encourage everyone to like really second guess themselves and like you know be their own devil's advocate to ask these questions Thank so you. back to, um, to, to the new question, which is commoditization of education. Um, I think it's, you know, it, it could become like a dystopian sort of problematic space where the only reason you're learning is because you want to earn, right? That's highly problematic. There are all these like learn, uh, earn to, learn to earn models or all of these models that are like saying like, hey, 
you're going to get a token if you learn X and Y. And, and if students are only learning for extrinsic incentives, um, as you know, professors or classroom teachers, we know that that can be really problematic. And so I think, and then that applies to micro-credentials too. Like, do you really want a micro-credential? Uh, do, do we really want micro-credentials to represent like the A plus that we got in a course? Or do we want them to represent like the effort that we put into it? Or do we want to put, have it represent the skills that we gained? These are all questions that I think need to be answered before we can actually use the technology to do it. Um, and so, you know, when we think about like, how are we actually engaging in learning experience and how are we showing that we have learned something, it has to go beyond like a test or an assessment or a, an A plus or whatever it is, or an institution name. Like we can't, one of the things that has always been um, problematic from my perspective is um, institutional uh, uh, reputation. So like if I went to Harvard, then I am more uh, valuable or more worthy of, you know, getting a job than if I went to a state university. And so how do we change that perspective um, in Web3? And how do we actually make the, the skills that you've gained and the proficiencies that you've gained the actual value and not like the institute that you went to? And so, so all of those are actually like open questions. I, I bet Scott has some, you know, theories and hypotheses on how we can veer away from it. But those are all open questions. And what was the second question? Uh, are are you seeing uh, Web3 uh, oh, yeah. in play? You know, how are institutions uh, adopting this? Yeah, so, you know, organization, institutions like MIT have been actually experimenting with this since like 2007, I think. They've been doing a lot of really cool things with like uh, with blockchain for a while. But there hasn't been like massive movement yet just because it isn't accessible. It isn't, uh, you know, easily understood by the layman. And there aren't a lot of platforms out there yet that make it uh, not only accessible, but understood on a level that is like utility based. And so um, there isn't as as far as I've seen, like massive adoption, but there are, you know, universities and, and institutions that are doing things like, for example, there's a, a school. Um, that's part of the big picture learning uh, organization uh, in Australia that has created uh, portfolios for students that are um, NFTs. And so each student actually is able to put their work into a uh, portfolio on chain and they can uh, own that portfolio um, again for the rest of their lives. And it's one of the first sort of like experiments in that. Um, but yeah, so I think there's like small sort of organizations that are doing interesting things, but nothing that I've seen that's sort of prolific yet. Right. Thank you. Super, super fast answer. I would say higher ed probably won't. Like, why would they? It kind of goes against their business model. It's going to be an and to me, you know, the 93% of the world that can't get a higher ed degree or the, you know, the 55%, 60% in the US. Like, that's, I think, where the innovation will start. And just like higher ed didn't start online education until they had to, to compete. Like I would imagine that's how it goes is the innovation comes elsewhere and then they see it and then they try to bring it in. A nice provocative uh, answer and <laughs> Frieden, thank you for that incredibly, incredibly rich uh, pair of answers to Sarah's very, very excellent pair of questions. We have time for one last question and it's a, it's coming from a terrific person, uh, a hero of mine, a wonderful, wonderful thinker and inventor, uh, Bob Stein. Let me bring Bob up on stage. Oh, hello, sir. Hi. Um, I I was just thinking that most of what was talked about relative to uh, Web3 had to do with ownership and not much discussion about pedagogy. And I'm wondering whether or not there's some insight you have into how it actually might change the the fundamental job of education, which is, in fact, pedagogy. Great question. Yeah. I mean, I, that gets me really excited. And, and I don't know if I have a great answer, except that it, if a professor can stack their knowledge on top of those before them, I think we have more exciting opportunities. There's a really interesting DAO called Open, what is it? Open Access uh, Science mm -hmm. Network, something like that. And essentially, what they're trying to do is incentivize um, scientific journals that are created with open access, you know, with uh, open journals. And so when you think about it, if you can open up more research, more science, if you have an awesome lecture, um, Bob, on like one specific topic, 
maybe you're not an expert on the entire class. Like I could bring you in and you could be compensated for that one hour versus the entire semester, right? And so you could see how you could bring in all stars and but specialize again, you're, in your but pedagogy. Again, you're bringing it down to ownership and the distribution mm, yeah, of true. cash. I, I could chime in here. Yeah, um, right, so Bob. this is this is an amazing question, Bob, and it is like one of my favorite things because I'm, I'm a K twelve educator, or I was. Um, and so I think about this a lot, like how is it actually changing the fundamentals of education? And I, I think there are a few things. One is that um, when you're thinking about uh, credentialing and about skills and proficiencies, you're actually leaning more towards like uh, proficiency-based education and, and, and performance-based education versus like, um, uh, you know, uh, stage-based education. And so that can lead to project-based learning, that can lead to experiential-based learning, and that can lead to um, students almost like um, owning their learning in a way that like they are, uh, they are focusing on their interests and their passions and building upon those skills. So like that's one thing, which is like, it really does lead to experiential-based learning. But then in order to further underscore that, the concept of the metaverse and the concept of this like virtual space where you can learn anything you want at any time, that really does change the way that um, you can think about the uh, the mindset of learning. So like growth mindset and like, you know, uh, uh, student centered learning and the ability to, to create uh, your own learning pathways, like all of that comes to play. And all of that becomes a lot more accessible because there's technology and infrastructure to support that. One of the my favorite things to talk about in the context of the metaverse is, um, do, do, did you ever watch the Magic School Bus or, or uh, yeah. So like that concept of, of being immersed in your own uh, learning and not having to sort of like derive information from like a static textbook that was published a hundred years ago um, but something that's like constantly updated and you actually get to be a part of the learning um, and choose your own adventure through the learning becomes such a more powerful experience and allows students from all over the world to access each other's worlds instead of having to learn in their own like regions and contexts. So that actually has massive implications on pedagogy. I, um, so that, that's a starting point, but there's like so much more that can be talked about there. All of that sounds terrific, although frankly, going back to web three i don't see where web three is necessary for any of what you just described about totally the hmm. yeah there, hmm. there's been a lot of conversation um already in the last you know 100 years um in education but but you have to think about this bob how many schools in the world are still teaching didactically versus project-based how hmm. many schools are employing bad frameworks for montessori versus how montessori actually was meant to be how many schools are employing Reggio Emilia and how many are not? And I think the reason for one of the uh, one of the reasons for why like we're still engaging in not great schooling practices and pedagogy models is because there isn't enough proliferation of content of, of knowledge among educators. There isn't enough connection and like uh, and sharing of knowledge. And concepts like the metaverse allow you to do that. They allow you to connect with each other all over the world without having to like worry about barriers just just one and just one last point then i i love your enthusiasm for it having lived through web 1.0 and web 2.0 these ideas i mean you know neil neil stevenson described the metaverse way back in in web 1.0 okay I, I would argue the reason why none of this has happened isn't because we were stuck in web 1.0 or Web 2.0, it's because we didn't actually have the social and political will to make the changes that hmm. I, you know, I think hmm. you'd like to see and I'd like to see. Uh, hmm. But end of end of rant. Well, that's that's a, a great rant, Bob, and a great question. Good to see you and and thank you. Um, it's also the end of our hour. I'm, I, I hate to wrap this up. I hate to pause this right now, but we we just blasted past the end of our time, and I'm going to have to let everybody go back to their lives. Um, thank you, Vriti and Scott, for such being such fantastic guests. Uh, this is it's just been great to listen to you to uh, and for you to tackle all of our questions. What's the best way to keep up with both of you? Is it your respective Twitter handles? 
Yeah, right. that'd be great. I just put it in the chat. I'd love to continue the conversation there. And I, I think we're all here to learn. And I guess the ethos that I like about Web3 is this idea of like shared learning and, and uh, composability. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to build on your ideas and critiques. Well, that's yeah, cool. agreed. Uh, Twitter would be great. And then I just uh, posted our newsletter for uh, Web3 and education. So it's basically um, a really uh, well curated uh, content that allows you to learn about Web3 contextualized for education. So that it sort of like teaches you about all the components, but then it tells you why you should care if you're an educator. Terrific. Uh, thank you both. Um, we'll, uh, uh, we'll be carrying this on. Um, on well, the recording will be up uh, hopefully tonight, and I'll do a blog post with your questions and the chat. Uh, nicely massaged for legibility and anonymity. anonymity. Um, but again, thank you to our two guests. Uh, but don't go away yet. Uh, I've got to mention where things are headed for the next few weeks. Uh, looking ahead, uh, we have sessions on the climate crisis in academia, libraries and careers, student debt, eco media literacy, minority students on campus, public higher education, and Web3. More on that. If you'd like to learn more, go to forum.futureofeducation.us. If you want to keep this conversation going, as some of you have asked on Twitter, you can just use the hashtag FTTE. People have already been tweeting out. Uh, you can tweet at me or at Shindig Events. And there's my blog URL uh, for the blog post and for your thoughts there. If you'd like to dive into the past, uh, especially for our earlier conversations, uh, including about decentralization, about pedagogy, about VR, and about blockchain, just go to tinyurl.com slash fdfarchive. And thank you all for a fantastic discussion. Uh, this has been very, very rich, thought-provoking. There's a lot to unpack. Uh, and we'll be continuing to do this. We will have more sessions coming up uh, over the next few months on Web3. I would love to hear your suggestions and thoughts about any guests or topics to bring up for that. Uh, in the meantime, good luck with uh, the rest of the semester. Good luck with all this work. And above all, take care and be safe. We'll see you online. Bye-bye. <laughs>